Well, good evening. Uh, we are off and running into our first real lesson of the Pilgrim's Progress. So uh, last week, we really went through an introduction of John Bunyan's life, which has a, a lot of uh, relevance into you know what we're going to be talking about tonight when we get into this first journey, uh, this first stage of the Pilgrim's Progress. So tonight we're going to start digging in into this allegory, and uh, when we when we look uh, at where we're beginning, Christian is in his hometown. This place that we're going to learn is called the City of Destruction, and we're going to travel just a little bit with Christian tonight. We're we're going to travel as he leaves the city at the urging of this this guy called Evangelist. And he's got this this guy named Evangelist is gonna point him to this wicked gate, which we'll talk about. Um, and really, you know, as we set this up, we talked a little bit about it last week, but um, you know, the Pilgrim's Progress next to the Bible has been published in more uh, English languages than, than any other book besides the Bible. And uh, if you ask today the general public how many people have read Pilgrim's Progress, unfortunately, studies have shown that we're down to like maybe 20%. And I know when we talked about this in the class that uh, it was probably less than that for, from you guys. So this is going to be great. It, uh, this is such a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, so when we look at tonight and we look at the outline, there were six different if you want to call them scenes, if you want to call them sections, however you want to call them. And uh, we're going to go through this first stage. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the first section uh, of this uh, first stage. And it's really the journey of how Christian left, how he started the journey. And once we get to, uh, past that first thing, we'll move along pretty good. Um, now, as always, uh, please let me know that you're out there, you know, so uh, comment on Facebook. I am so blessed uh, with, with e emails that you send. I know Marty sent one the other day. Uh, let me know of what's going, uh, you know, how you're enjoying the study. Uh, give me that feedback because uh, <laughs> I love it. Uh, mostly it keeps me encouraged that somebody's actually watching this. The second thing is, like we talked about when we, uh, when we were discussing about doing this study, is... Uh, share it with your friends, you, you know, share it with in, on Facebook. Um, let's just try to get some more people involved with it because it's such a great story. This is really the story of, of, um, of salvation. And um, as I was studying this, I was using a whole bunch of different sources. And, and, and one is a series of lectures that I think I've sent, uh, posted out there by uh, Derek Thomas, who is a uh, a pastor and a theologian who actually grew up in England, and he's currently the, the senior pastor at the First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina, and he's a, this distinguished professor of systematic and historical theology at the Reformed Theology Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. And when he started talking about one of his first lectures about the Pilgrim's Progress, he says that he tells these words to his students, which which I, I really enjoyed, uh, whether they're true or not, hey, whatever. But he says with, in his words, with great and considerable gravitas, um, I will tell them that if they have, they're not going to get into heaven unless they have read The Pilgrim's Progress. I love that. So, um, again, the, the introduction lesson went through this, but just as a way of review... The, the Pilgrim's Progress has two parts of it. Uh, the first part being published in 1678, which is what we'll be going on over. And then the second part, six years later, was published in 1684. Now, the second part's very interesting because it goes through the journey of uh, Christian's wife, who is known named Christiana, and therefore, boy. So in many ways, the, the second book is, is actually uh, more, uh, more interesting, better, however you want to put it, uh, because it, it's more of a, 
oh, a corporate uh, look at salvation, a, a family's look, and, and, the, and the look from the woman's point of view. Uh, so maybe one day we'll go through it. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but as a reminder, one of the things that we want to do and keep in mind as we're going through this allegory is looking at it through Bunyan's eyes, but then also looking at it through the eyes of Scripture. Um, so uh, when, when we look at it through the eyes of Scripture, we're going to find out that there is so much depth. And one of the things that I did, because there was no way I could cover all of this depth, was I gave you the commentary which I am using. And uh, that has a lot of the scripture references into it. But really, most importantly, is we want to make sure that we read this story thinking about how it applies to us uh, today. So, so as, as we go through this journey, I'm going to try to put in a, a strong emphasis on the application of how we should apply this to our lives uh, today. So, one thing I, we really should keep in mind is this is an auto um, autobiography of really uh, John Bunyan's. Uh, view uh, of, of salvation, of the doctrine of salvation. And uh, there's going to be some issues here that, that I'll try to point out uh, along the way. They arise really f uh, from a theological standpoint because we're looking at this, because it's autobiography in nature. Um, so with that, um, as we begin the journey and we apply this journey to our own lives, um, this is a thesis. This is a study of the doctrine of salvation. And one author put it this way, which I, I, really, I really like the way that he put this. And um, let me just put it on the screen so that you can read the quote. It says, uh, to journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city is more than just travel. Rather, it is, an, the, it is advancement of the highest kind, from sin to salvation, from heaven to earth. So with that, let's begin our story. And we're going to begin it where we started last week, which is reading that first part of the book. As I walk through the valley, excuse me, as I walk through the wilderness of this world, I came upon a certain place where there was a den, and I laid down in that place to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, a man, I saw a man clothed in rags standing in a certain place, with his face turned away from his own house, and a book in his hand, and a great burden on his back. So that's, that begins this story. This story. And as we read this, Bunyan starts out for us with this man. Here's a man who has his hand on a book. Now, this man, as we discover, is under a great deal of stress. He's carrying this great burden on his back. Now, he's outside the city carrying this book, and we learn later in the narrative, uh, and we've said it already, that this city is called the City of Destruction. This is where his wife and his children are. Now, Bunyan, he's telling us the way of salvation. For, for Bunyan in the 17th century, the way of salvation begins and began with this conviction of sin. And, and unless you are under and you understand the sin and, and you understand the weightiness, the gravitas of sin, unless you have this conviction of sin and sinfulness, the doctrine of salvation makes absolutely no sense to you. And, 
And think about that for a second, because, uh, you know, if, if we come to the cross of Jesus, not understanding that our sin is what put Jesus on that cross in the first place, we don't get it, okay? It makes no sense. It's just pure foolishness. And so now, within the first uh, 20 or so pages is this extended look of the issue of sin. Now, um, you know, before we get uh, really going in the story, I, I want to look at the description of this man in a little bit greater uh, detail. So one of the things that we see is that we, the, we, we're starting this journey in the wilderness of this world. Now, this to me harkens back all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 at the Garden of Eden at the fall. Uh, and, 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 and after the fall, Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden into the wilderness of that world. And, and you get the idea of this world be, being a wilderness. Now, Nicodemus, uh, I'm sorry, um, um, uh, the, uh, Nehemiah, <laughs> sorry, learn how to speak sometimes. Nehemiah alludes to this in this, his great uh, prayer chapter, chapter 9, and verse uh, 19, where he is saying about the people returning to Jerusalem after the exile, as he's praying to God, uh, he says, God, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. And, and he goes on to talk about the exodus, um, you know, from Egypt, when he says in his prayer, indeed, 40 years you provided for them in the wilderness, and, and they were not in want. So you get this idea of the world without God, without God's salvation being this, this wilderness, all right? And obviously we've talked about the den. This is the hearkening back to Bunyan's time in prison, but you got to think about this too. It also hearkens back to Paul in his imprisonment. And, and, and we look at how this man is clothed. You know, this man is clothed in rags, and he has a burden on his back. And many verses in the Bible talk about these rags that, are, that, that we wear and this burden that we carry. Uh, two verses in particular, is, uh, Isaiah 64, 6, which reads, For all of us have become like ones who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Paul really uh, quotes that in Romans. And in um, uh, the Psalm uh, eighty, or sorry, Psalm thirty-eight, four, for my in, uh, iniquities are over my head as a heavy burden; they weigh too much for me. So we get this idea of this uh, burden, this this um, this this weightiness of sin. We get of this idea of being in rags, our righteousness like rags. And, and I believe, and it's, it's really pretty obvious that, that Bunyan, in Bunyan's mind, this template that he's using, it, it's his own experience with salvation, but it, it is, it's really the example uh, in Acts chapter 16 of the Philippian jailer. And Gary and I were talking about this, you know, uh, there was absolutely no plan to do this, um, oh, this, this uh, uh, Acts, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, daily study that, that we ended up getting into. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's amazing how well that has matched in to our study uh, with uh, the Pilgrim's Progress. So um, it's amazing how God works, <laughs> you know, what, what we think uh, is, is our plan, uh, it, it really isn't. So anyways, um, you know, this harkens to this idea of Acts uh, chapter 16 with the Pilgrim's Progress when he's starting out, when Christian's starting out, he cries out, you know, what must I do? What must I do to be saved? And you know, John gives us this description of what happens uh, to bring this man into this crisis and this, this despondent state of mind. We read from the Pilgrim's Progress, I looked and saw him open the book and read therein. And as he read, he wept, he trembled. 
And not being able to contain himself any longer, he broke out with a lamentable cry saying, what shall I do? You hear the background of the Philippian jailer in, in Acts 16. In, in Acts 16, he just yelled out, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is John telling you the way of salvation, giving you evangelism in the 17th century. It, it begins with the book. It begins with the Bible the Word of God, and it comes to this man as he reads the Bible, perhaps for the very first time, that it brings him under the conviction of sin. And we'll talk more about that when we get into uh, World, Mr. Worldly Wiseman, this conviction of sin that uh, you can't do anything about yourself. Now, the Bible has convicted him of the danger of his position before God. And this harkens back to last week's study when uh, we read, you know, uh, as, he, as, as John was a child around nine or ten, that he felt that his own standing was God, with, in, with God was not right. So Bunyan came back, as we remember, as we recall, from the service in the army um, and, and, you know, he went to the army when he was about 15 years old. He probably came back when he was about 17 years old. And he married his wife and became complete. But he was still missing what that, that completeness, that peace that came with his standing with God. And it takes, we learn, uh, Bunyan 18 months from the time, if you remember, where he met those women, those women in the, in the town square, we called it the Starbucks, who, who were so different, so at peace, um, that it takes him 18 months until he becomes saved. He becomes born again. And in John Bunyan's own experience, he is uh, on his way to the cross at this time, under the burden of sin, this conviction of sin. And it takes him 18 months. And, and it's important to understand the Pilgrim's Problems because one of the questions that often comes out and, and, and that's asked is, why did it take Bunyan so long for Krishna to get saved? I mean, it's going to be until part three, until we get to the cross and the sepulchre, that this burden is lifted is lifted off of Christian in, in the Pilgrim's Progress. Now, Christian, as we have seen, has this burden, and he asks, what shall I do? And finally, he, he, he talks to his wife and his children, and he tells them about this crushing burden he feels, and, and wondering if there is some way of escape uh, from this perceived destruction, not only of himself, but the city. And now his family and his friends, you know, they, they can't quite figure out what's going on with him. And, and they think that, you know, he's probably sick. He might be a little crazy. So every good family <laughs> is going to go go take a nap, man. Go, go sleep this off. And in the morning, you will feel better. And so that's what he does. We read that he goes and he sleeps. And, and, and the sleep doesn't help. He, you know, he spends the night in tears. And in the morning, his family is like, hey, man, you feel better? You go, we told you, good night's sleep, that's going to get you. And there's, he's like, no, I'm worse. And, and like every good wife, she tries to comfort him. You know, Christiana is trying to comfort Christian. But, and, and she's trying to help the situation, and it doesn't go well. Because the next thing we see is Christian finally is, is, is looking out the door and he goes into his bedroom, sort of shuts the door and, and, and he prays and he does this for days. Um, and he does this for days and days. He's reading his book. He's praying. So he takes his book out into the field and he's reading his book and it's not getting any better. And he's feeling more and more burden. And he can't imagine. I mean, can you imagine this? Can you imagine the anxiety that he's feeling? He's down on his knees. And he's like, you know, I don't know what to do. He feels like the walls are coming down on him. And again, we hearken back to when Bunyan is ringing the bells and he felt this great uh, potential of, of the bells falling on him and crushing on him, crushing him. That's going to come back later in the story when we are on the trail to the, uh, the, the village of morality. But anyways, now... He, he, he's stuck and he's down. And here's one thing that struck me when I read this. 
Now, it's very subtle, but at the beginning, when he's reading the book, he says, what shall I do? And now after days of praying, after days of reading the Bible, he now says, what shall I do to be saved? Whoa! Sin has convicted him that he needs a Savior. Before he was saying, what shall I do? Now he's saying, what shall I do to be saved? And so one day, Christian is, is, is frozen. He's in the field. He's just frozen. He wants to run. You can tell this when you're reading it. He wants to run. He just doesn't know what to do. And Evangelist, this character Evangelist, just happens upon him. And he asks him, he says, for what reason are you crying? So that tells you, Christian's sitting in the field, and he's crying, he's wailing. And he says, one of my favorite lines, he says, Sir, I understand by my book in my hand that I am condemned to die, and thereafter comes a judgment. I find that I'm not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. And then uh, Evangelist says to him, why are you not willing to die since this life is accompanying, uh, accomplishing with so many evils? And, and, and Christian says, because I fear that this burden that is upon my back will sink me lower than the grave, and I shall fall into uh, Topha, uh, and, and that's hell. And sir, I, I am not fit to go to prison. And if I'm not fit to go to prison, I am quite sure I am not fit to go to judgment and as a consequence to execution. And the thoughts of these things make me cry. So you can tell this burden. He's, he, you can see the wheels spinning in Christian's head. And, and he's trying to work it out. He's reading about, uh, he's reading the Bible. He's finding out you know, he's reading the laws, and he knows he can't do these laws, and he knows his behavior and his actions are, are not good, and he can't figure out what to do. And, and Evangelist says to him, if this is your condition, then why are you sitting still? Why are you standing here? And, and, Christ, and Christian says, because I don't know which way to go. I don't know what to do. And Evangelist gives him a parchment scroll, and on that is written, flee. From the wrath to come. Now, interest, interestingly enough, uh, that is a line from John the Baptist when the Pharisees from Jerusalem come down to, to the Jordan River, and 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 John the Baptist looks up and he says, "Who told you vipers to come and flee from the wrath to come?" So, a little Bible verse there. You gotta love it. Uh, Therefore, the man read the scroll. So, Christian reads, opens the scroll that says, "Flee from the wrath to come," and he looks up upon evangelist very carefully and says, which way must I flee so as to escape? Then evangelist, you can just see him pointing his fingers to this large field. Do you see the wicked gate over there? And Christian's like, well, no. And then he said, well, do you see the shining light? Not quite so far away. And he said, I think so. And then evangelist says to him, keep that light before your eyes and go directly towards it. Then you shall see the gate at which, when you knock, you will be told what you need to do. So let's look at this, this, this evangelist character for a second. He, he is a, uh, a stereotypical evangelist, okay, who is probably based on the Baptist minister in Bedford who was John's mentor, this John Griffith, uh, Grifford, if you remember from last week. Now, one of the questions that has been asked over and over again is, is, is when they study the Pilgrim's Progress is, Christian, why, why is Christian sent by the evangelist to the wicked gate instead of going straight to the cross, all right? So we send him to this gate, Instead of, and that's not, the gate's not going to, this wicked gate, the straight gate, the straight way that Jesus talks about, it, 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 that's not it. That's not going to relieve his burden. So why not just send him to the cross so the Christian can get rid of his, of his burden? And, and when you think about it, especially as a uh, autobiography, it's because this is, this is Bunyan's own experience with salvation. Uh, I mean, 
He was under conviction, like we said, for 18 months, and he just didn't know where to go. So Christian is not yet a Christian, all right? He is an active seeker. And think about that in our church today. We've got people that walk into the building every day. They read the Bible, and we're going to talk about that a, a lot as we go on today, but yet they aren't Christians. They have not given themselves over to, to, uh, to Christ. They have not entered into that personal relationship. So Christian is not a Christian yet. And we learn later that his actual name right now is Graceless. And we learn later also that his name was changed. His name was changed Christian. So, again, one of my absolute uh, favorite lines in Pilgrim's Progress is this line right here. And, and, and it just tells you the inner conflict that's going on. Sir, I understand by the book in my hand that I am condemned to die. After that comes the judgment. I find that I'm not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. He doesn't want to die, and he cannot think of coming before God in judgment. All right? Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Uh, he, you know, he, he just, he, he's just so burdened down, he doesn't know what to do. So, um, we get this idea that something has to change. So Evangelist sends him on the journey, the start of the journey. And, and he goes, go to the wicked gate. And this wicked gate comes from Jesus' sermon on the mound, and it's uh, chapter 7. And it, it basically tells us there, Jesus tells us, even through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. Catching that? And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few that find it. That's where we start. Christian being told by evangelists, go to the wicked gate. Go to that small and narrow way that leads to life. Amazing, amazing. So Christian can't take it anymore. He can't stay in the city of destruction one moment longer. So he looks up and he runs. And you can see it. You can just see it. He takes off and his wife and his children are confused. They're like yelling at him saying, come back, man, come back. And, and what a commotion because we read this. Uh, hopefully you've read it. But if you haven't, you're going to get read, read it to now. Or I'm going to read, read it to you now. Here we go. So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. Now he... He had not run far from his own door when his wife and his children, perceiving his departure, began to cry out to him with, uh, that, so that he might return. But the man put his fingers in his ear and ran on crying, Life! Life! Eternal life! So he did not look behind him, but rather fled towards the middle of the plain. Okay. Life, life, eternal life. We've already seen that. The, the not looking back, that harkens to, Solomon, or to uh, 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 Abraham's uh, Saul, Lot's wife. Sorry, there we go. Wife, Lot's wife, when she turned and, and was turned into a, uh, in Genesis into a pillar of salt. This is how Bunyan sets the scene in the opening two or three pages of the Pilgrim's Progress. And it is a scene of this man, actually Christian, called Graceless, or Graceless called Christian at this point, and he is running with his fingers in his ears. His wife are chasing after him, and he doesn't know where he's running towards. He just knows that he's running to a shining light, and he's carrying this immense burden on his back. I mean, it's a road trip, man. 
think you know think about some of the movies that at least I love I don't know if anybody else does but it's very very familiar this this style of of starting in one place and ending in another place Lord of the Rings the Hobbit and and, and that that is the beginning of this journey all right um, now we're gonna we're gonna start picking up the pace a little bit now let me let me tell you that we've been going for like almost a half hour. Uh, and this is a good place to put it on pause if you've got to pause for a little bit because now we're going to get on to the road, all right? So let's start on our road trip. Let's hit the road. Um, and, and we're going to look at these events along the journey with Christian as he's traveling to this wicked gate. So Christian is running towards this shining light, and he's running towards the wicked gate. He has his fingers in his ears. He's not looking back, and his wife and his kids are pleading with him. And now we get these two friends, and, and I don't, I don't know if they're really friends. They're neighbors. We know that because he hasn't gotten. You know, he isn't even close to the wicked gate yet, and, and he's probably just out the out the, the the walls of the city of destruction. And we get these guys called pliable. And obstinate okay now the first thing that we we need to look at is, is um, you know this illustration of the worldly opposition to the gospel we know scripture tells us that we are not of this world that we are strangers in a strange land that everyone that becomes a Christian will experience some kind of opposition maybe from members of our family our friends maybe from our fellow workers, whatever. But Christian is starting to feel this opposition because uh, obstinate is this, this, oh man, he's this picture of stubbornness, this immovable worldview or point of view. Uh, and then his buddy Pliable is the, the complete opposite. He represents fickleness, an eagerness to believe anything except, of course, the gospel. All right, so, um, you know, think about that today in our world. Shoot, think about that on Facebook right now. Man, you type in a comment, there's somebody that always hates it. You type in another comment, everybody's like, oh, well, that's nice. You know, we, we get that today. So let's let's sort of eavesdrop a little bit, listen into this conversation. You know, Obstinate uh, asked this question, where are the, th the things that you seek since you leave the entire world to find them? He's asking him where he's going. And, and Christian tells him right from the scripture, I seek an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and does not fade away. And it is laid up in heaven, being secured there, ready to be bestowed at the appointed time unto those that diligently seek it. Read about it here in my book. All right, so, so Christian is quoting the scripture. And obstinate will have none of it. Tosh, tosh. Put away your foolish book. Tell me whether you will return with us or not. And Christian's like, no, 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 not for a moment, because I have laid my hand to the plow and will not look back. All of, all of that is an allusion back to the gospel. So, so at this point, opti uh, uh, um, obstinate, you know, tries to talk pliable out of following him, uh, but obstinate turns back and goes back to the city, and, and, and pliable continues walking with Christian and says, I, 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 I'm, I'm hearing of this, is, these things that you're telling me about is enough to ravage a person's heart. But how shall we be able to enjoy and share in these things? Now, uh, just keep an eye on a couple of things. What is Pliable asking about? And, and, and what is Christian talking about? So Christian says, The Lord, the governor of, of that country, has recorded such things in this book. The uh, substance of it uh, is that if we are truly willing to have it, he will bestow it upon us freely. Well, my good companion, Pliable says, I am glad to hear of these things. Come on, let's go. Let's, 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 let's go faster. Let's make our pathway quicker. See, here's the thing. At this point, we need to stop and, th and thank you. Well, first of all, <laughs> before I even go on to the story, I got I to gotta stop and thank you for letting me teach this to you. Because 
it's done a couple of things for me. One is it's forced me uh, to 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 read this with a different purpose in mind, and and, and uh, probably a better way to say it is I'm actually studying it more, uh, much deeper than I have in the past. And, and one of the things I've always wanted to do is, is read through Charles H. Spurden's uh, uh, Pictures of the Pilgrim's Progress, which is a a set of sermons uh, that he wrote. So I've I've actually gotten a chance to to read them. And and sir, uh, I love some of the things that that uh, that that Spurgeon points out. He he basically s- starts his sermon series out by saying, "Next to the Bible, the book I value most is John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. I believe I have read it through at least a hundred times. It is a volume of which I may never seem to tire, and the secret of its freshness is that it is so largely compiled from the Scripture." And it, it, it's really biblical teaching put into a form of a simple yet very striking allegory. Now, here's the point I wanted to get to uh, before I gave you that quote. And Spurgeon talks about it when he talks about pliable. And, and here are a few observations that we all need to know as we're sitting here listening and reading this conversation between Christian and pliable. And, and this is what Spurgeon writes about pliable. You perceive, however, that pliable has no burden on his back, as Christian has. This was one of the proofs that he is not a true pilgrim. That which brings men to Christ is a sense of their need of him. And by the sense of sin is not a qualifier of qualification for for salvation. So this sense of sin is not a qualification of, of salvation, yet it is the only motive that ever leads men to trust in Jesus. It is the impetus that divine grace uses when it dr- is drawing or driving men to the Savior. So we see this difference in pliable compared to Christian. Pliable has no burden on his back. He, he doesn't get the idea of, of, of his sin. He wants to come along for the ride because he's hearing of all these great rewards, uh, you know, these, these, these great, uh, you know, inheritance, all right? He's not wanting his soul to be transformed. He's, he's wanting basically, you know, the, the good stuff. Okay, and and here's a first point of of you know our application, and that is the recognition of sin is our journey to salvation, and this really points us to um, the the error that goes on with the prosperity gospel. All right. Prosperity gospel just sort of tells you, you know, here's, here's a way to live better, to feel better. If our goal is to present the gospel in just this idea of winning heaven and escaping hell, and most times they don't even talk about hell, all right, you're missing the point, all right? The journey is the relationship with our Savior, the relationship with Jesus. Once we have that relationship, we begin with with the help of the Holy Spirit to grow in holiness, to begin to work out our sanctification, to be transformed into the image of Christ. That's the goal. The rewards, you know, they're great. And yes, the, the, the escape from eternal damnation and punishment and hell, I'm all for that. Uh, but yes, you know, the, the, the transformation to be more Christ-like is what we want, all right? Uh, the crowns are great. We should strive for the crowns that Paul talks about, but we want the relationship, all right? Pliable is starting out with the wrong gate <laughs> in his mind. He's not, talk, he's not thinking about the small, narrow, wicked gate. He wants the large, wide gate. And I fear that many today have their eyes on the rewards instead of the relationship. So um, I want to point out two last things in this section. Actually, I'll let Spurgeon do it. He's better at it than us. And, And he basically says, first, our job in the role of Christian, who is being an, uh, 
evangelical uh, uh, evangelist at this time is this conversation of love with others. Love others where they're at on their journey. And this is the way Spurgeon puts it. He says, it is the work of the Spirit to fill the gospel net. All right? Casting the net. It is our duty to throw it and drag it along the bottom. And whatever we catch, good fish or bad fish, is not so much our concern as the master's. Christian, though not yet at peace with himself, had a commendable love for others. So we see Christian telling the story, testifying of where he is at his point to this pliable, which is great. That's the way we should do it. Second, we should never, ever, ever hide the fact that becoming a Christian, a follower of Christ, comes with a cost, all right? This is the anti-prosperity gospel. And, and this is the way that Spurgeon says it. So pliable, without counting the cost, or reckoning for a moment upon all the difficulties on the way, sets out in a thoughtless, lighthearted manner upon that journey, which will always prove too long, for those who start out on it in their own strength alone. Now, um, Alexander White, who is a famous illustrator and commentator of Pilgrim's Progress, summed it up perfectly, this idea of pliable. Pliable was willing to go with Christian for the benefit that Christian described. He wanted eternal life. He wanted the promises that God makes to bless you. This man is open to these things. If you were to ask him, do you uh, want to have your sins forgiven? Do you want eternal life? Do you want to be a Christian? He would answer yes to every single one of them. He believed Christian because he believed everything. He's typical of many modern folks in our own time today. Don't you think so? That they're open to anything, whatever happens, to work. All right? And that's pliable. Pliable never read the book. Pliable was never burdened by the sense of his own sin. So he was like the seed in the Lord's parable of the sower in Matthew 13. So Matthew 13, this, uh, this is, I'm going to read to you the explanation in Matthew 13, 18 through 23 of the parable of the sower and the seed. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anybody who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one whom... Seed was sown on rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it in joy. It's, this is pliable. Yet, he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when afflictions or persecutions arise because of the word, immediately he falls away. That is exactly what's going to happen to pliable. And then the one who's... who's uh, seed was sown with thorns. This is the man who hears the word and worries about the world and the deceitfulness of wealth and chokes out the word and it becomes unfruitful. And the one whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it, who indeed becomes uh, bearers of fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. This is little conversation with Pliable and what's going to happen at the Slough of Despond is Bunyan's commentary on how people like obstinate and Pliable respond to the gospel. So let's keep moving on the trail because the next thing that happens is Christian and Pliable, as they're talking with very little uh, idea of what's going on around them, and with very little prayer, not paying attention at all, they suddenly find themselves floundering in this slew of despond. Now, John writes, 
Here, therefore, they wallow for some time, being shamefully debased with dirt. Then Christian, becoming uh, of the bur- because of the burden that was on his back, began to sink in this mire. Now, we find out that Christian and Pliable are in this slough, this river, this quicksand, all right, of mud. Now, bon- Bunyan attempts to describe how the conviction of sin can actually lead you to a condition that uh, is actually worse before it, it, it gets better, all right? Now, this is true of anyone. I mean, I should say this isn't true of everyone that becomes a Christian, okay? Uh, but, you know, not everyone experiences this idea of it getting better before it gets worse. Now, we have to remember, this is an autobiography. It's John's own experience with salvation before he came to this assuring faith but uh, he actually went down, and this is John, down and down and down into a further and further and further conviction in this depression of hopelessness of his condition. So sin in John's life and how he's depicting it in the slew of despond, it got worse and worse. Now here, here Pliable, he's still there. Now he continues with Christian but what happens is, because he's sort of uh, not weighed down, he's light on his feet, he quickly gets out of this quicksand, but he gets quickly out of it on the other side, closest to this city of destruction. Now, Christian's weighed down by his burden, and, and he gets farther and farther into the quicksand, but he keeps going, all right? He keeps going. And uh, Pliable gets out of the quicksand while, I love this, while Christian's still in it. And he says, you go, man, I'm out of here, all right? And Christian gets to the other side, and he comes uh, out, and we, we find this, this other character, this other man named Help. So... Help is on the other side of the slew of despond. And, and this is, this is a, another evangelist, just like the real character of evangelist himself. This is you, all right? This guy named Help is a, a, a picture of what you should be. You can be a help to somebody, all right, when you show the love of Jesus. So Help is there. And he aids Christian uh, back out of the slough and back onto the path of salvation. Uh, he, he, he puts out his hand, he grabs it, and boom, Christian's out. Now, upon uh, getting out of the, 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 the slough, Christian asks help. Uh, you know, you can just sort of imagine it. You get stuck in quicksand. He's like, dude, why isn't this marked? Why along this path? that is leading to the straight and narrow gate, why isn't there caution signs? Why hasn't somebody fixed this mess? And and help gives him a a really, really interesting uh, answer. He goes, this miry slough is perpetual in that it cannot be mended. Being low-lying, it attracts a continuous stream of scum and filth that is associated with the conviction of sin. For this reason is called the slough of despond. As the traveling sinner is uh, awakened about his lost condition, there arises in his soul many fears, doubts, and discouraging uh, uh, perceptions concerning himself. Then all of the accumulated and and piled up, it accumulates and piles up in this place, so this is the reason for the badness of this ground. It's a discouraging place. Help continues to describe it on how millions of instructions uh, to try and mend this place have gone up, but they've been swallowed up, that the light, lawgiver has placed steps. Get this, he, pl- he has placed steps to enable a traveler to find a way to get through the slough. Now, John is describing here how he descended into this period of depression and despair as he was seeking uh, what to do, and, and he was under this conviction. And again, we told you 18 months in his personal life. And, and if you remember, um, you know, he had been rebuked for his language uh, by the, by the, the, the 
dirty mouth, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, storekeeper. Uh, he heard the voice of God uh, when he was playing tin cat, and he and he and he talked to these ladies in the town and, and, and saw their piece and and wanted it, knew he didn't have it. And at this point, we still haven't found the gospel. He still hasn't found the gospel in him. He still hasn't found the way to salvation, the way of assurance, the forgiveness of his sins. So back to the story. Um, you know, he, he helped gets him out of the slough of despond and he's back on the way, back on the path to the wicked grave. And obstinate is gone. Pliable is heading back to the city of destruction. Um, and help is left and gone on his way. <clears throat> now we're introduced to another character um, along the journey. Mr. Worldly Wiseman. And Mr. Worldly Wiseman is going to send Christian to a place called Morality, which is this little village. And he's told he's going to meet with this guy called Mr. Legality, who, after Christian ha and Mr. Worldly Wiseman have this conversation, is skilled, as Mr. Worldly Wise Wiseman says, uh, in removing burdens like Christian is carrying. Think of this as this the today these positive self-help folks, you know, the ones that say if it's going to be it's up to me. You know, read this book, follow these steps and your life will be grand. You can be positive. And and this is this is the way of works. This is the way of obedience. This is the way of removing your burden of sin is is to do more and more, you know. Uh, it, it's to obey the Ten Commandments, to throw your, yourself into uh, this life of obedience. Um, it's works. It's works salvation. Um, now, a little bit later in the story, evangelists will tell Christian three things about worldly wise men. He says, first, that he has turned Christian onto the wrong path. Second, that he makes the cross odious, stink to him. And thirdly, he suggests a way that can only lead to death, the way of works. Now, folks, um, this way of works is prevalent in Christianity today. This way of getting over our guilt of sin, our burden of sin is to do good, to do more good, to do much, much, much more good, to leave, lead a perfect life, to 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 try to uh, live out the Sermon on the Mount. It ain't gonna happen, all right. And um, let's read what Bunyan says in his autobiography. He says, "Thus I continued about a year." all of which time our neighbors did take me to be a very godly man, a new and religious man, and did not did marvel much to see such a great and famous uh, you know, alteration in my life and manners. And indeed, so it was, though yet I knew not Christ, nor grace, nor faith, nor hope. For as I have well seen since, had I had died, my state would have been most fearful. Yeah, you know, Bunyan turned over a new leaf. He pulled himself up by his own bootstrap. The attitude of if it's going to be, it's up to me, basically was, was his calling card. Um, th this is the person that looks like they have it all together. Probably serving in the church. Probably you know, out there volunteering, out there going and, and helping the homeless, going out there helping the poor. Shoot, this person could be on the administrative board of our church today. This guy that thinks that they're doing all these good works, this person, this man, this woman, they're doing all these good works, and that's how they're going to get saved. That's how they're getting over their burden of sin. So Bunyan is saying something very, very important here. 
The way out of conviction of sin is not by works, not by the road of obedience, not by obeying the Ten Commandments, not by feeding the poor, clothing the hunger, doing bridge, you know, uh, 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 church under the bridge, all those things. All of those are good, but that's not the way to salvation. And we, you know, Christian, he, he basically follows this trail, follows this trail down to the village of, of morality. And, you know, it harkens back to those bell ringing days because what happens of, of John Bunyan, what happens is, um, you know, Christian is walking down this trail and we find out that, that it's, 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 falling down on him this hill is gonna he feels like it's gonna crush him uh you know so christian departs from his present course and he's heading down this trail and it's scary it's gonna crush him he feels paralyzed by fear he stops rather than going any further and as a result he figures out that his burden is actually getting heavier as he's trying to go up this hill the, to, to, to the the village of morality and this hill, the, as Bunyan says, is, is flashing with fire and it's erupting. And, 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 and basically, he's terrified. He's terrified. Um, now, we read here this, this poem by Bunyan, and it really tells you what's going on. You know, he's been taken out of the way. He's trying to go up to this Mr. Legality because that's what Mr. Worldly Wiseman told him. He's off the way. He's off the path. And all of a sudden, because of the, the legalistic way of thinking, his burden's heavier. So, so here, here's Bunyan's poem. When Christian unto cardinal men gave ear, out of their way they go and pray it for to dear. Pay for it, to it dear. <laughs> for master worldly wise men can by show a saint the way of bondage to woe. There you go. There's his poem. And Christian is, is basically sorry that he listened to the advice of Mr. Worldly Wiseman. This is Bunyan's preaching on the gospel. He's preaching Paul. He's preaching uh, Romans uh, 30, 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And, and this is what was discovered. This was what the Reformation was all about. Uh, this is Luther in, in the previous century to, to Bunyan uh, that acts of obedience to the law by works of the law that no man, no woman can be justified. Um, you know, another great poem is, is by Augustus uh, Toplade that says, Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no reprise? No. Could my tears forever flow? All for since could not atone, thou must save, and thou alone. That's the point. This idea that works won't lead you to salvation. And, and at this point, Evangelist enters again. We see him, and he sees Christian on, off the path, on this path to uh, the village of morality, and he asks exactly what you would expect him to ask. What are you doing here? <laughs> Why have you gotten out of the way? You were supposed to be heading towards this light, the path to the wicked gate, and he, you, you have veered off the path. And Christian tells him his sad, sad, sorry story, and Evangelist quotes from the Scripture, from the book of Hebrews, he quotes this great line. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape 
who turns away from him who warns you from heaven. And that's the point. Christian falls down and says, Woe is me, for I'm undone. More conviction, more burden, more sin. But Evangelist reassures him that God will forgive him. God will forgive all kinds of sin, no matter how dark and terrible they are. And Evangelist here points him back towards the wicked gate, back on the way, on the path. And that's where we're going to end tonight. Christian is once again on the way, on the path to the light, and you could say the life. Now, to put some application, and, 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 and I've sprinkled a little bit on, but there are three points that I hope you take out of this first stage, and that is there has to be a conviction of sin for salvation to make sense. If you need a Savior, you need a Savior for a reason. Christ died on the cross for your sins, so that your sins could be reconciled, all right? Now, the second thing is count the cost. Becoming a Christian is costly in this life. You must count that cost because once you are on this path to the celestial city, it is not easy. This, this idea of the prosperity gospel saying it's easy, that, that once you become a Christian, everything will be great is wrong. You will not be accepted in this world. You, but, but the idea of not being accepted in this world is such a small price to pay. That's what Paul talks about. It's such a, a small price to pay for the eternal glory of a relationship with Jesus. So when we ever present the gospel to somebody, we can't sugarcoat it and basically say, your sins don't matter. They do matter. You have to be convicted of them. You have to repent of them. Uh, and second, there's a cost to being a Christian, all right? It's not this wonderful, magical potion. It's not. It is worth it, though. And second, you can't get there by working your way there. The world will want to give you this quick fix of your problems. Uh, we know that the law was meant not meant to save us, but it was meant to show us that we needed saving, that we needed a Savior. Good works done for salvation will not work. Good works done because of salvation is the production of fruit. All right? So hopefully these three things you take away from this wonderful, wonderful story. And I hope you're enjoying this, this journey. We've just begun. Christian has not even yet been saved. He's not a Christian yet. Next week, we're going to arrive at the wicked great gate, and we're, you know, we're going we're gonna to meet another character there, and then we're going to travel and journey to the house of the interpreter. Christian has not arrived. Christian still has his burden, and he will still have his burden next week. Till we meet again, there is the story of the Pilgrim's Progress for our first stage. Uh, let me pray real quick. Uh, that way I make sure that uh, I honor Emma, who, who reminds me to pray when, 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 when we're together. Lord, thank you for this example. Thank you for this example of the doctrine of salvation brought out by this man, John, John Bunyan, through his own life experience, but through his own preaching and his own life. Lord, let it be an example to us. Let us be convicted of our sins, Lord, that we may repent of them. Um, Lord, let us count the cost to follow you and know that your yoke is easy, the burden is light, but this world will fight us all the time. And Lord, may we not ever, ever think 
of the works that we do as works for salvation, but may we love you so much that when we love our neighbor, we are loving them because of our love for you, because you first loved us. Lord, (laughs) we love you, and we say all of these things in Jesus' name. Love you guys. See you next week.